Thank you very much. I think um, you know it clearly shows the linkage between the two. For example, in a country like India, uh, you know, one degree rise in the temperature amounted for about six million tons of less productivity in wheat, which which has a very direct implications on livelihood, on nutrition, and so forth. And therefore, I think uh, South Asia is a region where uh, these linkages between the various uh, uh, various insecurities, let's call them, um, are 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 very very severe. Uh, but one must also not forget that South Asia also comprises of some of the some of the other countries and uh, sub region within the region um, uh, which are often more vulnerable bhutan for example being one example um, um, uh, andamans and nicobars uh, which is part of india uh, being another uh, example so what i would like now to uh, do is to open up a little bit uh, for the audience to uh, to bring in uh, very, very focused suggestion, very short uh, suggestions on if there are any other priorities, not only for these countries, but also for a country like Bhutan that was perhaps uh, left out from the list that was just presented by the panelist. Yes, Anita. Uh, I'm Anita Regni, I'm at the CGI Consortium. And um, it's a great, thank you so much for the introductory remarks. It's a great opportunity to have the representatives of the region uh, of many countries here uh, that I automatically tended to think in terms of regional issues. Uh, clearly climate change is a big problem for all the countries and including Bhutan, that's not here. So it would, and the other, I mean, both the supply as well as the uh, consumption side of issues. The supply is affected by climate variability, the consumption by, access to food. So I was curious in the region if there's been significant progress made on regional collaboration on sharing data regarding weather, etc. Uh, the other issue is on the uh, cross-border trade, which dramatically affects just about everything. This could be two days of discussion, so I don't want you to make it be lengthy, but very succinctly, if you could let us know if there's been any progress towards those two issues. Thank you. Okay, we'll take... Uh John and then the professor from uh, Bangladesh here, and then we'll come to you. Oh, thank you. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. And my, uh, throughout this conference, we've heard a great deal about community-led strategies. And I know all of your countries have decentralization models, but uh, not a lot of capacity development at the lowest levels, the panchayats, the parashats, et cetera. What, how do you see, um, that strengthening these uh, lowest tiers of government could help with the uh, issues of climate change adaptation and uh, addressing issues such as behavioral norms and social norms that uh, uh, Dr. Dev brought so up. So that's the question, John, that will come in the second round, which is going to talk about the solutions. This is more of a flagging of the priorities, but the panelists have noted that. Okay. And I'd, so the priority uh, would be decentralization. That you're raising. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just here and then there, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, excellent summary presentation from uh, each of those cases. Uh, uh, particularly, climate change is going to cut across everybody, whether Nepal's, uh, you know, uh, GLOF or Pakistan's flood, India's various uh, disasters. Sri Lanka already haze and uh, and Bangladesh we know disaster problem uh, and as for Bhutan, uh, GLOF, the uh, you know glacial uh, lake outburst flood and various other phenomena are already taking place. I happen to be the chair of Climate Action Network South Asia, so I know a little about that. My question was for maybe in the next round that the solution of South Asia individually per country is much more difficult while collectively South Asia can probably make tremendous effort for all South Asians. And climate change, which will demand that much more energy is produced in all these countries for all the growth that we will need and alleviating the poverty. My sense is that uh, there are opportunities in um, hydroelectricity which could be carbon free as opposed to, and could probably free, this is the sources obviously Nepal, Bhutan, India, Pakistan, you know, across 
in a harmonized way could solve a lot of this problem. And let me make it clear, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, hydroelectric state is not trouble free, nor is it environmentally totally sound until we get it right. But a coordinated effort to get agriculture and our food security issue, as well as nutrition and all the demands we will need will drive us crazy with energy needs. And I was just wondering whether each of you in your consequences could comment on that and see if we can think of a greater uh, South Asian grid, which has already been talked about, a system which can take us farther beyond the obvious of running between our borders and, and you know, banging our heads. So collectively as a region, you mean? Yeah. We'll take one question there and then we we'll come back here and the last question will be there because we have to move to the second round then. Uh, I was actually wanting to discuss solutions, but I'll now flag one issue. But you must give me a chance to speak sure. about solutions. <laughs> All right, the next round. Uh, while uh, 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 we are aware India as a tropical nation uh, 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 faces the uh, risks, the adverse consequences of climate change and of course there is looming water shortage. Uh, one more constraint that will affect agriculture is land constraints. We have about 140 uh, million hectares of land under cultivation. Uh, the land use intensity is rather low, just 1.3. Ideally, it could, I, I believe it can go up to 1.7, 1.8. Lot more land will be available because you have 270 days of sunshine. What are we doing to improve land use intensity is, I think, a very critical question that uh, uh, we, we all need to address uh, from an Indian uh, perspective. Uh, I think I'll stop here. I, I want to speak more in the, in the next right. round. Yeah, Thank you. Um, we take one question there. He's been raising his hand. And then we take here. And then we go into the record, second round. I'll start with one observation. You know, this is quite interesting to me from coming from South Asia. South Asia is very rich in agricultural practices. So we are discussing over the last two days about how agriculture can address the whole issue of nutrition, food security, and we don't see much people here. That actually amazes me. Secondly, I think that most of the time in this conference we spoke about industrial food production, not actual agriculture. So in Africa and South Asia, we do agriculture. You hardly have even farmer in Europe or in the USA, but you can still see farmer in South Asia and Africa. This is quite an interesting observation to see here. So I think that one thing you know, that we should start thinking, make the differences between what does it mean by industrial food production and what is agriculture. I, I th see there is a serious lack in conceptualizing. Secondly, I think that most of the time, we bring in economic categories in discussing of the farming. Let's say subsistence farming, then I think of subsistence farming from ecological perspective. Subsistence farmer is the most resilient farmer. They survive on the day-to-day -day basis. So if you want to understand, and if you want, if you're really interested to understand resilience, then you have to study subsistence farming as a resilient ecological system, as a node within the much wider complex of ecology. So this is also lacking in this whole conference. And also I can see that many of the presentations have been here. I have, you know, uh, end up with some question, broad question for all of you, not only to the panel members. See, our problem is not only weather shock. Our problem is also technology. The Green Revolution bought the technology and that has already created a shock. It produced, of course, I mean, cereals, but it also reduced the pulses. See, we're discussing about the nutrition right now, so we have to review what we have done in the past. So you've lost the pulses, you've lost the oil seeds, you've lost many other species, and now we're talking about nutrition and food security. We have to study it first. So this is one thing that we need to rethink. I think there are many policymakers who are discussing here, and policy researchers, they need to reorient what is the real problem in South Asia. Secondly is this, that farmer seed system has been destroyed. If you destroy the farmer seed system, and then you talk about the resilience, this is a totally contradiction, but this is another very important thing that we are trying to talk about marketing, about you know, consumption, but in the meantime, we have already destroyed the pharmaceutical system that is the basis of agriculture. Thirdly, the climate change, when you talk about, the variability of the weather, 
is something farmer faces every day. Agriculture means managing uncertainties of the weather. So we don't have to really bring in again about climate change as it's a problem, of course. I'm not denying it because in my friend Atik is in here. He knows better than me about this. But it's most important that when you use the word climate change, we have to be very careful about it. That's also another way of robbing the local knowledge of the farming communities of the South Asian countries of the nation from the capacity to deal with it. So my, my suggestion will be that we should think about those. Thank you. We take the last uh, comment, especially uh, adding on to the list of priorities of the region. Thank you. My name is Lola. I'm an independent consultant. I'm just intrigued to learn a little bit more about whether and how resilience offers you opportunities to do anything differently in securing nutrition, uh, the nutritional, a more secure nutrition security <laughs> in your countries. In Nepal, I th but to paraphrase you, I think you were saying that it's, it's created a common language and a common understanding that has allowed intersectoral co cooperation across ministries. And I just wonder if there are examples from the other countries on the panel about specifically what resilience has brought to your quest to improve agriculture, to improve, improve food security, to improve nutrition security. But what's been the additional element that resilience has brought to I all mean, that? I mean, next element? session. Yes. <laughs> next session. So it's, it's more of a nexus between the various, various ministries and various policy-making bodies.